Hey, this is Witt. Uh, I'll be doing a topic analysis of the September-October Lincoln-Douglas topic uh, for everyone on debate trolls. Uh, they'll be used to supplement the additional topic analyses done by other coaches. So to jump right in, uh, quick topic background and coverage of some core arguments on the lit that will probably be very prevalent uh, in many case debates. Uh, first, what is a uh, shield law uh, reporter's privilege, a uh, right to protect the confidentiality of sources, etc.? Um, all of these uh, are generally used to refer to a category of law that's done uh, through the judiciary or statutorily through uh, the federal or state government. Uh, these laws uh, allow journalists to refuse to testify about the identity of a source. What this means is many times journalists, when interviewing people, especially for secretive topics about you know the government, national security, weapons, etc., uh, in order to get people to you know reveal hidden information. Uh, they'll promise them confidentiality in order to, you know, ensure to them that the publishing of that information can, won't be tied back to them through the journalist uh, revealing who gave them that information. Uh, a lot of journalists say this is extremely important. Uh, it allows them to, you know, get access to information and s stuff that's secret that the public should know. Uh, very often, journalism seeks to, you know, expose corruption. Uh, reveal uh, truths that are being hidden by corporations, governments, etc. And without, you know, strong guarantees of confidentiality, uh, it can become extremely more difficult uh, in order to get that information. Um, so starting off with a background of the status quo uh, and how these shield laws are sort of existing, uh, current and uh, how the right to privacy is playing out, uh, in the status quo, especially in the past year, the use of subpoenas to journalists to reveal their sources has been increasing a substantial amount at the state level. Uh, a subpoena is basically a formal court or prosecutorial uh, order to uh, provide information uh, to the government uh, or a third party in civil suits. Uh, these subpoenas... Uh, in previous years, it's been close to about five publicly revealed ones a year at the state level. So far this year, from the latest statistics, there have been at least 14, which is a massive jump um, from previous levels. So I think if you deep into, dig into recent literature and articles, you'll see a number of journalists raising alarms about this. In addition, the, in the status quo, Trump is attacking leaks in the press pretty heavily. It's not only, you know... Uh, arguments about fake news, him arguing about CNN being, you know, corrupt and all of that sort of thing, but also attacks on leakers. Uh, a substantial amount of information about the Trump administration has been revealed in publications like the New York Times, CNN, Huffington Post, etc. And Trump, in response to this, uh, has been, you know, arguing about a crackdown on leakers. Uh, something important to note is uh, federal subpoenas are very rare. Uh, especially secretive ones. There is recently a case which uh, raised major alarms with a security national security reporter named Ali Watkins at the New York Times, uh, and the federal government uh, basically informed her that they had gotten an order to search through her communications, uh, text messages, etc., uh, to try to find the source for some of her articles. Uh, in the construction of a criminal case against one of her uh, Ex someone she'd previously had a relationship with. Uh, this information did not seem to have a compelling national security concern uh, or reason that she didn't even need advance warning about it, and the government went uh, without any warning, searched her communications. This is sort of unprecedented, and it's happened very recently, which you know poses substantial threats to government openness and transparency, especially... Uh, you know, from the perspective of journalists. There are some important core debates that will apply to most affirmatives, regardless of, you know, whether they specify what level of government, uh, about uh, shield laws and their importance and their efficacy. An important one uh, is 
whether, you know, subpoenas and that sort of things are really working right now. If they're not working, is it sort of necessary for the government to impose these laws? Uh, a substantial number of uh, journalists, uh, journalists and communication scholars say uh, they're actually not that necessary in the status quo because journalists, most of them, will rather than responding to subpoena and providing information, will actually choose to go to jail, uh, which means, you know, obviously it's not ideal and it does create a chilling effect. But uh, the fact that many journalists, especially like ones who uh, are working on frontline cases, are more willing to you know go to jail than protect their sources, means that damages to sources are not as important uh, as journalists. There are also people who obviously say that this misunderstands the situation. The simple fact that we are jailing journalists is bad in itself, and uh, it creates chilling effects. Those chilling effects are, you know very related to the arguments about efficacy. Uh, they're related to a few things. First is the simple fact that the government is, you know, retaliating against sources for revealing information uh, means that people are less likely to come forward. Uh, the fact that they can be prosecuted for revealing information and journalists may have to choose between going back on their promise of confidentiality and going to jail makes people less willing to reveal information. Uh, additionally, the simple inconsistency uh, between laws and uncertainty about, you know, what shield laws govern in any specific person uh, means that even if there are shield laws, for example, the state level, since journalists are unsure about their scope and there's uncertainty in terms of precedent, uh, they're less likely to do it. Uh, many negative authors argue that, you know, the amount of subpoenas that are happening right now, like, 14 is an unprecedented number for uh, in a single year, yet it's not very much. The vast majority, probably 99.9% .9 plus of articles, do not ever face this sort of retaliation. Uh, and in those cases where it's needed, many do have, you know, viable national security interests in finding out who leaked information. Uh, this means that, you know, the idea that journalists are suddenly deterred, especially in a way that, you know, causes massive shocks to democracy, like uh, many apps will claim, uh, might be out of hand. Uh, yet, affirmatives will likely respond, just the very possibility of it uh, does chill journalism, and the increases in it recently uh, have do pose substantial threats. Another debate that's extremely important, and not just in the question of topicality, uh, is what is the definition of a journalist? Uh, this will be covered a lot uh, in other topic analyses based on topicality, uh, but this has important implications on case. Uh, um, this has important implications on the case debate. Uh, journalist definitions can be, you know, very narrow in scope, only covering people who work for a news agency, uh, which excludes things like bloggers, a lot of independent news sources, etc., and sort of having these definitions of what a journalist or reporter is uh, means that it will prioritize some forms of media over others, which crowds out, you know, important investigative journalism. Uh, some people argue we should instead use a functional definition. A functional definition of journalism is one that talks more about the process. It's not a question of who you work for or what your occupation is, but more the function of what you use the source for. For example, uh, many define it in terms of, you know, seeking to do investigations to reveal truth and publish them for mass consumption. Uh, definitions like those uh, link less into the arguments about how a narrow scope can be bad, yet are also more vulnerable to things like picks uh, out of, you know, bloggers, uh, news sources like Breitbart, which will be covered a little more later on the K page. Um, but so these important debates don't just... Uh, have importance in terms of topicality, but also in terms of your offense. Additionally, the ambiguity and difficulty in defining a journalist makes it extremely hard to, you know, implement a law that can create those clear boundaries, uh, which means apps will have to find a way to define it that's best for their offense, as well as avoiding, like, art defensive arguments about how it creates ambiguities in the laws. Another common case argument is about journalist licensing. Uh, while it may sound a little absurd on face, 
uh, many people argue that a system that privileges journalists over other people and gives them specific rights like a privilege law uh, create precedent for uh, laws that you know license who can do journalism and be covered by these. Uh, it has parallels, for example, in broadcast and cable news where uh, in order to get uh, part of the airwaves, uh, people have to apply for a license. These in uh, TV news can be incredibly expensive. Uh, it leads to, you know, the ability of a government to censor content through denying licenses to people they disagree with, uh, which, you know, can also chill speech uh, and will likely be a common turns case argument. Additionally, uh, an argument I think AFS will want to leverage is international modeling. Uh, the United States is uh, one of the few uh, major countries that does not have shield protection for journalism. Uh, the EU and many other you know, uh, parts of the world do have this, including many developing countries, but many developing countries lack this sort of uh, shield law, which uh, especially in countries that are hostile towards a free press. Uh, authors argue that the implementation of a shield law would, you know, prevent countries from utilizing the fact that the United States does not protect journalists uh, for their own gains. And, you know, having consistency allows us to better influence uh, and promote a free press throughout other countries, uh, which is outlined in this Fusion card in the slide. Important debates, which were covered a bit above, were whether bloggers should be covered. Uh, should, you know, uh, people who are just writing not for profit but posting information be covered? Uh, there are substantial less checks on what content they can publish, which means, you know, they can make up sources a lot more easily, which, you know, there are important arguments on both sides, and it's one of the core debates in the literature over whether bloggers, people on Twitter, uh, video journalists on like YouTube should be covered. A final important debate is how, you know, strengthening a uh, right to the free press would damage other amendments in the con and rights in the context of uh, a shield law. The Fifth and Sixth Amendments both deal with the right to trials, uh, being able to prove your innocence, uh, and that sort of thing. Shield laws, uh, can pose significant damages to the truth-seeking process, not only for governments, but defendants. Because, uh, for example, if someone, if a confidential source contradicts a claim, uh, lies about what someone says, without the ability to reveal them, especially when someone is being accused of wrongdoing, uh, can mean defendants have a harder time defending themselves. Uh, which means that there may be a trade-off between the certain rights uh, that also, uh, damages citizens, possibly to an even greater magnitude uh, than a reporter's privilege would protect. Next, uh, I think the core advantage that most big stick AFs will defend is democracy. Uh, it's one of the most realistic ones that's grounded in the literature. Uh, so the next few slides will cover uh, some important uh, questions uh, and defenses of the advantage I think are important for people to have. On the uniqueness debate, uh, I think what's important to point out, because an important, because an argument that, you know, negatives will make is the idea that democracy is incredibly resilient. Uh, the fact that it's existed through, you know, incredibly uh, dangerous uh, presidents who flout norms, uh, who reject constitutional protections, i.e. Andrew Jackson, uh, means that uh, it's skeptical that, you know, the affirmative is the one thing that makes or breaks whether democracy survives. I think there are a few important arguments AFS want to make in defending this advantage. First is that, you know, the advent of Trump changes everything. Uh, through recent actions he's had in, you know, challenging the free press, um, He's had him challenging the free press, cracking down on leakers, as well as, you know, him joking about things like abolishing term limits and making himself president for life, uh, all show that, you know, he's willing to challenge basic democratic norms. A lot of authors challenge not only through Trump, but in general, the faith and resiliency. Uh, prominent authors like Matthew Iglesias, 
uh, as well as others, write about how uh, democracy is incredibly tenuous, especially now, uh, and our perceptions of pre-World War II democracy and its stability in the face of fascism uh, kind of don't necessarily apply one-to-one -one in the status quo. Uh, additionally, internationally, there are you know, major geopolitical changes that make protecting democracy incredibly important. There is a rise in right-wing populism uh, and extremism throughout major European countries, uh, as well as in the United States itself, as well as growing authoritarianism that uh, pose significant challenges to democracy, which show the importance of, you know, defending the importance of basic rights like a free press in the status quo. Additionally, there have been through things like the Arab Spring and many other recent rebellions, as well as governmental crackdowns, uh, using the United States as a model is important for countries transitioning. These all link to a modeling argument. I think people should be defending because it gets them access to much larger impacts on the democracy debate. Uh, a constitutional law professor at Harvard Law School, Professor Feldman, uh, writes about, wrote about this recently. He said, the pre this president says the press are enemies of the people systematically. It weakens our capacity to act democratically. If you look at places in recent years where we've seen democracy eroding, for example, Turkey, one of the ways that that erosion has happened is through subtle, careful, slow undercutting of press freedom. These arguments all kind of link to the idea that the democracy is not as resilient as people think it is, and the importance of a free press and liberal rights uh, is a commitment we should be embracing in the status quo, rather than relying on the fact that we've weathered the storm in the past is able to work in the future. The internal link debate, uh, the evidence is actually far better than I expected when I first started looking into the topic. Uh, this is contributed by, oh, by a few things. Uh, first is the fact that journalists uh, and uh, people who write about politics are the same ones who are being you know, under threat of this, which means they tend to write pretty persuasive and uh, sometimes hyperbolic, reasonably. Uh, on the topic because of the fact that it's something they care personally about. Uh, there are a lot of articles which, you know, explicitly make the claim that in order to protect democracy, especially in the age of Trump, we need to uh, strengthen reporter privilege. Uh, a few key internal links are, for example, press attacks. Trump is attacking the press as fake news and, you know, criticizing uh, the ability of the press to work. Uh, strengthening rights, especially through a GOP Congress uh, or through the Constitution, uh, allows journalists to work against you know the crackdown on leaks. Additionally, investigative journalism, especially through places like ProPublica, The New York Times, Washington Post, and other major outlets that do that sort of work, uh, rely on uh, secrecy. The fact that Trump targeted uh, a New York Times security reporter create substantial deterrence to the main organizations that act as checks on Trump's act as checks on Trump and other aspects of the government. An example of a card that I think makes this argument in a pretty strong form is from an author named Rotman. Uh, he says journalism doesn't work in a democracy if reporters can't protect the identity of their sources. Anonymous sources are often the only way to report on sensitive national security stories like the Pentagon Papers, which detailed governmental lies to the American people in the lead-up to the Vietnam War, or the torture of secret detainees in the aftermath of September 11 terrorist attacks. Protecting journalists' ability to do their jobs without government interference ultimately protects the public's right to information about what's happening. The impact debate. Uh, you'll want to win a big impact uh, that can effectively, you know, weigh against many arguments on the negative, especially case. Uh, I think important impacts to democracy, especially if you win modeling, are democratic peace theory. Uh, a substantial amount of research has been dedicated to the idea that, you know, global democracy prevents wars and conflict because it leads to conciliatory policies, uh, especially considering, you know, major hotspots of conflicts have been places like Russia, uh, and China, which have, uh, you know, substantial anti-democratic regimes uh, that crack down on things like a free press. Uh
creating an international norm of democracy and using the United States as a force uh, to promote it worldwide uh, is able to stop conflict. Additionally, I think you should utilize the sort of slow violence and structural impacts uh, of democracy uh, against things like chaos. The lack of democracy, many authors write, leads to things like civil wars, ethnic cleansing, and genocide, uh, which is uh, not that outlandish considering recent developments in places uh, like former USSR states, which have uh, had things like, you know, substantial uh, and horrifying crackdown on sexual minorities, uh, racial minorities, etc., uh, as well as the rise of uh, especially uh, in Europe and the United States, uh, far-right movements that capitalize on weakening democratic checks uh, in order to harm minorities. Other arguments and a uniqueness claim you want to make is about backsliding. Uh, many recently transitioned democracies, such as in the Middle East, uh, without uh, face a significant risk of backsliding being taken over by authoritarian regimes, which is why promoting democracy can prevent that sort of backsliding that is even worse than, you know, just straight authoritarianism. You may want to leverage specific scenarios, places like Turkey, China, Russia, etc., and the way that United States modeling is key to check back against them, which gets you access to things like China war scenarios. Hedge, of course, is uh, something a lot of authors write about in the context of democracy. The United States being a leader in the sort of international liberal norms, uh, best protects hegemony, which has its own access to tons of impacts worldwide. So that covers a lot of, I think, core debates and advantages and disadvantages people will read. Uh, I next want to talk about processes, counterplans, and specific mechanisms of implementations relevant on the topic. The first important uh, debate is about the state-federal divide. This topic is unique compared to a lot of LD topics uh, in that the states versus federal debate is not as clear-cut. Uh, states implementing uh, a shield a right to uh, protecting sources uh, wouldn't probably have much effectiveness on the federal level. But additionally, federal law uh, it's ambiguous whether they're able to implement it on the state level, which substantially strengthens the permutation regardless of which one the AF defends. Uh, Follow-on arguments. Uh, there aren't really many arguments, and I'll cover specific ones that people often use. Uh, there are fewer arguments people can use that all are compatible with an argument like federal follow-on, and a good amount of literature that's about disadvantages to the federal and state level or, you know, about things intrinsic to implementing it there, rather than perception-based in terms of politics and federalism. So that's an overview to the state-federal divide. 49 states, 49 states currently have some degree of shield protection for sources. This uh, is less clear-cut than it sounds. The state implementation of these laws diverges pretty wildly. Different states have qualified... Uh, have different levels of protection, whether it's qualified, absolute, whether it can be overridden, whether it's founded in common law, statutory law, done at the judiciary or legislative level, um, etc. This makes it very hard uh, uh, to determine exactly the level of protection, and it's definitely not clear-cut uh, when it's applicable. Many people write about how this patchwork effectively nullifies a lot of the laws. Uh, especially given recent changes in the past decades to news reporting where, you know, it's no longer localized. You don't have a local paper, uh, at least in major cities, that only people in that local city read. The New York Times distributes all around the world, or all around the world and country. Uh, news outlets are increasingly online and don't have one jurisdiction. Uh, journalists face significant uh, hurdles to being able to be confident that what they publish in one state won't be forced to be revealed in another state, and what protection is applicable. This, you know, many authors write about the necessity of a uniform law, which I'll cover in a bit. 
uh, to resolve that. But this sort of ambiguity uh, and the fact that news production is increasingly nationalized uh, and digitalized means that, you know, we can't just rely on the status quo to be able to solve it. However, the fact that 49 states currently have them does, you know, change certain debates about federalism and politics. Federalism uh, is probably not as strong on this topic, at least from what I've read, because of the fact that states have already done the sort of laboratories of democracy uh, that people write about as being the net benefit of it. Uh, 49 states currently have wildly differing policies. Uh, we've been able to see which ones are more successful than others. We've been able to see which ones are not successful. Uh, the federal government implementing a shield law would likely not be as uh, damaging to federalism, considering it would just bring the federal government at a level of parity, and also would not intrude on states' rights, considering uh, the lack of applicability to them. Additionally, politics, uh, the fact that these shield laws do exist and have faced relatively little backlash at the state level may, you know, have significant implementations on the politics debate because it shows they can be implemented in a way that does not necessarily, you know, cause political unpopularity, considering the widespread nature of them across the nation. At the federal level, it's even more unclear. While the Supreme Court in Brandsburg uh, ruled that there is no First Amendment right, uh, there is distinctions among the appellate court level. Different circuit courts uh, have come to different conclusions. Some courts do recognize a journalist shield founded in common law in the First Amendment, and other courts do not. Uh, this divergence of opinions means that it's not as clear-cut as there simply is no federal law, but there certainly is not some uniform protection. This makes it messy. Additionally, state law can have an influence. Uh, when It's a pretty technical legal process, but there are certain cases called diversity civil suits, which occur when the defendant and plaintiff of a civil case are in different states, where state law can determine uh, whether reporters' shields can be pierced. Uh, all of these debates are pretty relevant. Uh, I uh, put two quotes up here from academic articles that uh, talk about the importance of a federal shield law and another one which talks about the importance of a uniform state shield law. Uh, you'll find that this is one of the biggest debates in the literature as you do research. Uh, and it's important to, you know, determine exactly how the AF and your counterplants influence those. In terms of implementation options, these can be run as both affirmatives and counterplans. Uh, common ways courts can advocate in the literature for how courts can implement the law are, for example, overturning Brandsburg uh, at the Supreme Court level. overturning Brandsburg at the Supreme Court level. Uh, a common one that's recommended in the literature is overturning Brandsburg at the SCOTUS level. Uh, doing this would, you know, challenge precedent. Apps would be able to challenge, uh, you know, flawed precedents, uh, which may be extrapolated to other impacts. There are other ways that could be implemented that don't necessarily challenge the ruling in Brandsburg. Brandsburg did not say that there is not that it is unconstitutional or that there is not a constitutional right to journalist privilege. It said that there is no First Amendment uh, privilege. A, a way of implementing it at the Supreme Court level that's been proposed recently uh, is through the Federal Rules of Evidence, specifically Rule 501. This uh, is a change in the rules of evidence uh, and court procedures at the federal level that occurred after Brandsburg. Uh, it create it allows for the creation of new privileges through common law. Uh, this is the basis of things like uh, therapist-patient privilege as well as attorney-client and that sort of thing. Uh, authors write about how there could be a common law privilege to journalist source confidentiality that would not 
overturn Brandsburg or challenge that precedent, which would avoid many court legitimacy dissents that link to overturning long-standing precedent, especially when the Supreme Court has very recently declined to take on appeals to it. There are also statutory, which means uh, legislative uh, and legal and uh, written out law proposals. There's a wide variety of ones that have come up. There have been many iterations on the Free Flow of Information Act, as well as other proposed ones through the literature. Going through all of them uh, would be basically impossible, considering the wide breadth of this topic. Common, uh, the, I'll cover some common ones uh, at the federal and state level uh, in terms of how they could be implemented in ways that avoid some common arguments. An app, I think, is strategic, is one that uh, implements a new law at, that's uniform through the 50 states to protect privilege. The advantage of this would be, A, uh, it avoids a lot of arguments about how the state level is extremely messy, uh, and it solves those and creates a uniform uh, privilege that journalists can rely on uh, rather than, you know, having to guess where they're protected. Uh, this would also, you know, avoid a lot of politics uh, and dissatisfaction arguments considering states already have these laws. Uh, the difference is it makes them uniform and stronger and creates a floor uh, for all of them, which, you know, allows you to non-unique a lot of dissatisfaction while still claiming an advantage for the affirmative. Additionally, because a vast majority of subpoenas are at the state level, uh, it would be hard uh, the sol it's actually not as hard to make solvency deficits to a federal law. If your app or counter plan implements it at the federal level, uh, some authors, uh, namely someone with the last name Elrod, uh, talks about how using the Commerce Clause, which gives the government uh, the authority to regulate interstate commerce, uh, they could implement a law that regulates state as well as federal behavior. This poses interesting constitutional questions, whether journalism counts as commerce, whether it truly crosses borders, but there are proposals that allow for the federal government to implement laws uh, that, don't, that can also affect the state level. An interesting proposal I've seen in the literature is a way to implement the act by ratifying the Inter-American Declaration of Principles on Human Rights. Uh, that would probably be narrowly tailored to its right to journalist privilege. This is something that, this is a treaty that has been ratified by almost all major uh, American, i.e. North, Central, and South American countries, other than the United States and Canada, uh, which gives a substantial precedent as well as modeling argument about, you know, the credibility it sets for the United States in promoting stuff. Ratification of this would establish a right to journalist privilege within the United States, and the fact that it's a treaty, which gives the federal government authority, would potentially allow it to also be enforced at the state level. An argument that's probably the most core pick on this topic uh, is the national security pick. Uh, a law, AFS may defend absolute immunity. Journalists never have to give up the sources. This pick would allow for courts to create a balancing test uh, to allow for uh, enforcement of a right uh, enforcement of subpoenas uh, in the case where it threatens national security. There are a few arguments that are strategic for this. First uh, is that there are good cards for why it avoids a politics net benefit. Uh, while an absolute rule would allow for people to you know uh, criticize it as being weak on crime, uh, terrorism, etc, uh, allowing for that sort of pick uh, would make it significantly more politically feasible, and a great deal of literature actually strongly supports this claim. An argument when going for this that is strategic to win uh, is that in the absence of the pick, courts will just whittle down the law anyways. Uh, authors write about how it's extremely likely in the face of imminent and real danger, courts would be willing to even enforce the law, which means circumvention effectively makes the app a pick anyways, which means all the affirmative net benefits are non-unique, but you still get access to things like politics. 
There are also, of course, Terror, Hedge, uh, and other similar uh, dissets that can be read with it, uh, with arguments that allowing for it, uh, allowing for the exception, uh, prevents us from, you know, facing a situation where national security is at threat because journalists won't reveal their sources. Affirmatives that uh, are defending against this will want to defend that exceptions are always bad. Uh, sources, you know, do journal will journalists have to say, uh, I promise confidentiality unless the Supreme Court upholds a three-part balancing test uh, that, you know, potentially means I have to reveal who you are. In these sorts of situations, uh, it poses risks to whether sources will actually be willing to come forward, which means it may link to all your advantages, even if sources aren't necessarily coming forward because of national security. Courts also will exploit loopholes in order to create broader ones, which means even if the exception is narrowly tailored, uh, the mere existence of an exception will justify future ones, uh, even if the law stays on the books. The final thing I'll be covering uh, is some case on the topic. Uh, there are other case that are also covered in other topic analyses, so make sure to watch those in addition to this one. Um, the first one I'll be covering is a nuanced take on the cap K. Uh, it's called, it's a theory of capitalism called communitive capitalism. Uh, it's primarily uh, pioneered as a concept by an author named Jody Dean, uh, who has written multiple books on the subject. Uh, she's a prominent anti-capitalist uh, that has been expanded on, especially in the age of Trump. Communitive capitalism uh, is an argument about how the rise of information and digitalization of the media age, i.e. all journalism is now online. We now have Twitter where journalists will be posting updates by the minutes. We have live streams, 24 hour seven news cycles, uh, constant break in news, Facebook, etc. All of which create overwhelming circuits of information. Uh, this is supported by capitalism, even if, you know, it exposes things. Uh, difference, critique, and opposition are just registered. We no longer, you know, have the transformative potential of, oh, there's an investigative journalism article that shows, you know, Trump's a bad guy. It merely, you know, gets posted on Twitter, people see it, they're like, oh, that's interesting, and move on to the next thing in the 24-hour news cycle, which means the sort of faith in the proliferation and circulation of messages and information doesn't really have any overlap with institutional politics. You know, it's similar to a lot of Baudrillard-esque arguments about how, uh, you know, the constant use of revealing Trump's misdeeds only supported his rise. Uh, it doesn't really have any impact on what he does and empowers him. He The use of the idea of the fake news media just gives him more support. This is also very tied to... The idea of democracy, which a lot of apps uh, will defend. The association of like democracy and liberal ideals with the expansion of circuits of information is bad. We're in the time of the most information ever, and we still have Trump and the rise of far-right extremism. Corporate media and, you know, protecting it is in fact a profoundly anti-democratic force uh, that, you know, perpetuates narratives that uh, best support it, yet reject uh, things and self-censor things that oppose dominant uh, narratives. Uh, sort of desire for democracy within communitive capitalism ignores the way that communitive capitalism nullifies that, and the desire only leads to its own failure. Uh, additionally, uh, there are authors who argue in, under the system, the idea of transparency revealing information through investigative journalism and that sort of thing, all of which I think most apps will defend, uh, misunderstands the way that capitalism operates. It relies on the idea that if we know one more thing and reveal it, uh, we'll suddenly be able to challenge Trump and that sort of thing. Uh, let's Trump be like, I have the real answer. Here's what people are hiding from you. Uh, here is the truth, despite the fact that it is not true. The sort of, you know, proliferation of representations of transparency don't necessarily have any correlation uh, to anything other than, you know, Trump being able to capitalize on that. And there's a lot of historical analysis of things like how in the Bush administration, transparency after 
all led to only more uh, power, as well as, uh, you know, the idea we want to reveal Iraq's uh, weapons of mass destruction. Additionally, uh, this can also be applied to more generic capitalism critiques, the idea of a state focus and focus on state censorship of media ignores how this centralization of it leads to private censorship that uh, prevents the sort of releasing of dominant anti-narratives, releasing of narratives that uh, oppose dominant narratives when Rupert Murdoch uh, and a limited number of media elites own the vast majority of information distribution. It leads to self-censorship, which is equally bad, if not more, to a free press, which means capitalism sort of controls all of this. It also leads to things like BuzzFeed, clickbait, uh, and fake news uh, because of the profit motive for, you know, whatever gets the most eyeballs rather than truth, which means ca combating capitalism uh, is a necessary prerequisite to solving for any investigative journalism argument. Shield laws specifically are quite heavily referenced. Uh, they're used to define legitimate and illegitimate media, bloggers versus journalists, and that sort of thing that crowds out uh, leftist media. There are specific articles about how past shield laws, like the Free Flow of Information Act, would not have protected uh, important alternative news streams uh, from the Black News Report to uh, places like Jacobin and Current Affairs. This ties in with the fact that this can be read and is, in fact, I think, a great argument about capitalism and leftist affirmatives. Uh, there's a lot of arguments uh, uh, in the context of community of capitalism about how this sort of idea that all the left has to do is, uh, you know, write more articles and circulate information about capitalism and suddenly we'll be able to reach a mass movement or revolution is flawed, which is a central thesis I think a lot of capitalism affirmatives will make. Within the system of community of capitalism, this n both nullifies resistance as well as, you know, displaces focus on material organizing and institutional politics that are necessary in order to create transformation. While the sort of faith in more publishing as being able to solve things uh, prevents that and crowds out focus. The idea that more leftist publishing is needed is the sort of community of capitalism. Another argument, uh, which is also from Jody Dean, uh, is psychoanalysis. Uh, some of the cards are actually quite fantastic for this topic. Uh, it extends from her theorization of community of capitalism uh, and ties it to Lacanian uh, uh, theories of psychoanalysis uh, and draws heavily on work of authors like Zizek. Uh, I'm not going to go too deep into it, uh, but the arguments tie to the sort of desire for secrets uh, and what we don't know, and uh, the faith in the ability to reveal them uh, is bad. We enact this fantasy of publicity uh, by, you know, revealing things. We bring things out in public and say, uh, now we have democracy and that sort of thing, yet our drives block that introduction of truth from creating resistance which means a lot of affirmative theses, theses about a free press being good and able to challenge corruption are incorrect uh, because of the nature of the death drive and the self-sabotage uh, it creates. Also writes, uh, She also writes about the desire for democracy and how it culminates in pseudo-activity. Uh, our faith in just liberal democratic ideals prevents resistance uh, and that sort of thing and immobilizes political movements. A uh, path that can, you know, sort of go in the direction of critique literature is securitization. Uh, it can also be read as an advantage to a plan F. Uh, the concept of securitization is fairly broad, but the idea of the government constructing threats and capitalizing on national security incidents uh, in order to promote a securitized vision of public life to expand government power a lot of literature and discussions of shield laws are premised on the need for secrecy, uh, not for sources, but for the government, uh, and how uh, we need to uh, 
protect government secrets as well as, you know, reveal government reveal whistleblowers and deter them from revealing that government information. A lot of it is built on the fear of, you know, another 9-11 and a terroristic uh, or foreign other uh, and the dangers they pose, which a lot of authors criticize in the context of shield laws uh, and how we should, you know, implement them in order to challenge the government sort of notions. Uh, it creates a culture of secrecy that kills democracy and civic life. Uh, which is another internal link people can read to democracy advantages. It also gives a sort of impact turn uh, slash discourse argument about national security picks and a lot of core topic arguments. Uh, use, justifying exceptions to civil liberties based on national security lead to things like Guantanamo Bay, drone strikes, uh, because the government is able to best know what's uh, good for the country and national security which I think affirmatives can criticize if they take a more K direction uh, to affirming. Other K arguments, which uh, I'll cover briefly, uh, in terms of race arguments and identity arguments, uh, people should, uh, if you're interested in things like model minority arguments, uh, looking into the case of Dr. Wen Ho Lee, could provide a good starting point to an affirmative or critique on the topic. Uh, he was a government scientist who, uh, in a high-profile case, was accused uh, and indicted for revealing government secrets. A lot of the things that contributed to the publicity of the case were journalists publishing anonymous sources, uh, were journalists, you know, uh, publishing anonymous sources and the use of a shield law uh, would have prevented him from, you know, gaining a settlement that challenged uh, the way they constructed him as a threat. Uh, he turned out to be innocent and not guilty of a vast majority of the government charges. And there's a lot of literature about how his case corresponds with the myth of the model minority within technological and scientific fields, as well as the way it create, makes them vulner, makes Asian Americans vulnerable uh, to threats. Uh, it makes them vulnerable uh, to the sort of taken away of civic liberties. Additionally, uh, race, Islamophobia, and the alt right, and how they all interact, uh, are influenced by how affirmatives increase media power. Presumably, if the affirmative is broad enough, would also protect places like Breitbart. Uh, possibly places like Stormfront, The Daily Stormer, and other extremist, violent, uh, and racist websites and racist websites uh, that have contributed to the growth of uh, mass racism and extremism within the country. Uh, critiques could uh, draw on this in the way the affirmative protects us under the guise of promoting liberty and democracy when they hide a certain racial element and ignores the way that the press has become militarized against minorities. That covers uh, the majority of what I think uh, is relevant under those topics. Uh, you should make sure when doing your research and previous and as soon as possible watching the other topic analyses as well, which will go into more disads, uh, philosophical, as well as uh, theory grounds as well as other things like K's that were not covered in this. Uh, so if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me and other coaches uh, and make sure to get started on doing prep as soon as possible.